In this lecture, we will be looking at Chapter 11, Early Medieval Europe. Now, there is a note in your book where they talk about the terms medieval and middle ages, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in depth once we reach the Renaissance. However, the term the Middle Ages was actually given to this time period by the people in the Renaissance. And the reason why they called it the Middle Ages is because there was a belief that nothing really important happened during this time, that it was a time that was so widely controlled by the church and it was basically just almost a waiting period, a time between the Roman Empire and then the Renaissance, which was the rebirth of the classical ideals. And as you see in the note in the book, um, it's now understood that that is not a fair assessment of this time, that there were many important things that happened, including many artworks that were created. Now, the 500 to 1000 was a great formative period of Western medieval art. In the early Middle Ages, the monasteries of Northern Europe were both repositories of knowledge in the midst of an almost wholly illiterate population, and they were often the greatest centers of art production. Early medieval art in Western Europe was a result of a fusion between the classical heritage of Rome's Northwest provinces, the cultures of the non-Roman people north of the Alps, and Christianity. And we're going to see that as we look through the different periods in this lecture. We're going to start uh, with the Merovingians and the Anglo-Saxons. Now much of the art and architecture of the non-Roman cultures has been lost. What has mostly survived were small portable status symbols that were often buried with the person, such as weapons, bracelets, pendants, a fibula, remember that was the pen for holding clothing, and belt buckles. People in the Middle Ages regarded these objects as treasures and they were used to enhance the owner's prestige. They often display a high degree of technical and stylistic skill, and we see that in the work that we are looking at here. This is a purse covering that was found at the Sutton Hoo ship burial. In, <coughs> excuse me. in 1939, archaeologists discovered a treasure laden ship in a burial mound at Sutton Hoo, which is in Suffolk, England. This shows the early medieval tradition of burying great lords in ships with rich furnishings. Now this purse covering is using what's called the cloisena um, ornamentation and it's circa 625. And what this is, is it's smoldering small strips of um, so small metal strips edge up to a metal background. Then you would fill the compartments with semi-precious stones, pieces of colored glass, or glass paste fired to resemble sparkling jewels. It's almost a cross between a mosaic and stained glass. Now the medieval artists only use this on a small and miniature scale. The metal craft with interlacing patterns and other motifs beautifully integrated with animal forms was the premier art of the Middle Ages. And you can see that in the different medallions. Um, I believe it's five, four out of them uh, have animal workings in them. Now the idea of who was actually buried at Sutton Hoo is uncertain. Next we're going to move on to the Vikings. In 793 the Vikings were pre-Christian traders and pirates of Scandinavia. Um, in 793 they landed in the British Isles and they were known as the Norsemen which literally meant North Men. Uh, and they would often attack monasteries. Why? The monasteries would often have these treasures and they were undefended. From 793 until the mid 11th century, the Vikings were the terrors of Western Europe. Now they did not just raid and pillage, but they also colonized the land they conquered. They had a talent for organization and administration and were able to acquire and give, and give large territories in England, France, and Ireland. When they settled in northern France in the early 10th century, their territory became known as Normandy, meaning home of the Norsemen, and later known as the Normans. Now, much of the preserved art of the Vikings, again, consists of the decoration of their great ships, such as the one on the left here. Um, this is a burial ship that was found in Oosburg, Norway. It's circa 820. It's made of wood and it's over 70 feet long. Now this also would have been laden with treasure, but treasure uh, hunters have 
long since um, ta uh, taken anything from there. We can see also this in the, in, in the image on the right, and this is a decorated wood portal of the Stave Church circa 1050 to 1070. Again, you see these graceful elongated animal forms that intertwine with flexible plant-like stalks and Trindle's inspiring rhythm. This exemplifies the intertwining compositions favored by most non-Roman peoples north of the Alps before their conversion to Christianity. And we'll see that continue in other works. Here we're going to look at the Hiberno-Saxon monasteries. At the same time as the previous two groups, Christian missionaries were establishing monasteries in Northern Europe and sponsoring artworks of Christian content. These Christian artworks are among the most distinctive ever created and testify to the fruitful fusion of the narrative and imported artistic traditions. I'm sorry, the native and imported artistic traditions. So we're going to see in this, this blending. Um, Ireland, interestingly enough, developed a different form of monastic organization. And what happened there is monks often uh, selected very inaccessible and inhospitable places where they could carry on their duties free from worldly temptations. The Ionan Monastery, which is actually in Scotland, became one of several major artistic centers in the Middle Ages. Art historians called the art of these monasteries Hiberno-Saxon or insular to denote the art of Irish and English islands. Hibernia was actually the Roman name for Ireland. Now, illuminated Christian books were the primary vehicle in the effort to Christianize Britain, Scotland, and Ireland. Books were sacred, they were scarce, and they were je je jealously guarded treasures. Interestingly enough, the term Bible, it means the book, capital B, in Greek. Now, illuminated books are the most important existing monuments of the brilliant artistic culture that flourished in Ireland and Northumbria during the 7th and 8th centuries. One of the most characteristic features of insular book illumination are full pages devoted to neither text nor to illustration but pure embellishment and that's what you see on the left here now this lent prestige to the book and they're called carpet pages because they resemble textiles these were decorative panels of abstract um, abstract forms and animal forms now such manuscript pages have no precedent in greco-roman books an example of the Hiberno-Saxon art at its best is what you see here on the left. And this is the carpet page from the Lindop Farm Gospels. This was produced in a Northumbrian monastery on the Lindup's Farm, excuse me, island, circa 698 to 721. Here you can look and even zoom in on yours if you can, uh, the inter intricate patterning and details. There's this vivid effect of motion and change we see these serpentine interlacements that are contained, though, by the dominating motif of the inscribed cross. And what the dominating motif in the inscribed cross does, you can see it outlined in the red, it actually stabilizes the rhythm of the work. We see animal forms intermingling with clusters and knots of line, and the whole design vibrates with energy. It's full of small, infinitely complex and painstaking design. Now, also during this time period in, in Ireland, high crosses also made an appearance. These were in Ireland and Northern England, and you can see an example of this on the right. Uh, this, they were set up usually in the 8th and the 10th century, and they were very large in mass and scale, and some were actually over 20 feet in height. Now, these were freestanding works, and they were placed in burial grounds adjoining monasteries. And we can see this one, the circle intersecting the cross identifies it as a Celtic work. Now moving on to Visigothic and Mozarabic art. Um, the Romans ruled Spain, but in the early 5th century, the cities there fell to German invaders, most notably the Visigoths who had converted to Christianity. And we see their influence strongly in these smaller stone churches, such as the example on the left. This is a small church of San Juan Baptista, or St. John the Baptist, which was built in 661. 
The Vis Visigoth churches are basilican in form, but often have multiple aspects. They regularly incorporate also horseshoe arches, which we'll see more in the next chapter. Now, the Visigoths were eventually pushed out by the Islamic caliphs, and the term Mozambic refers to Christians living in the Arab territories. And then Christian art still continued to be made at this time, and you can read that about that in a little more detail in the text. But next, we're going to move on to the Carolingian Empire. On Christmas Day in the year 800, Pope Leo III crowned Charles the Great, who was then known as Charlemagne, as the first holy, meaning Christian, Roman emperor. Now this purposely took place at St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Charlemagne consolidated the Frankish kingdom of his father and grandfather, defeated the Lombards in Italy, and laid claim to reviving the glory of the Roman Empire. And this was called the Carolinian Renaissance. It was a brilliant revival of art, culture, and political ideas of early Christian Rome. And Charlemagne was very determined to do this. He himself, you can read in the text, was a very educated and learned man. His official seal bore the phrase, Renovation Imperii Romani, which means the renewal of the Roman Empire. He commissioned imperial portrait statues in large numbers of illuminated manuscripts. He also fostered a general revival of learning. He most zealously cultivated the liberal arts and held those who taught them in great esteem and often conferred great honors upon them. And so what we're looking at here, this is a 9th century bronze statuette. It's about nine and a half inches tall. We are not 100% percent sure who it is. Some people think it's Charlemagne and others think it might be his grandson Charles the Bald. However, what is clear is the model of the work is the equestrian portrait of Marcus Aurelius that was in Rome that we looked at in chapter 7. It follows the same idea. The emperor is overly large, so he and not the horse is the focus. Now what's different in this one is um, the emperor is shown in parade. He's, a, he's in a parade and he's wearing his imperial robes. Now he does have his sword, but he is not going for battle. He also wears a crown and he holds a globe in his outstretched left hand. This is a symbol of war, war, world domination. And this portrait proclaims the renovation of the Roman Empire's power and trappings. We see this clear connection to the, the work of the Roman Empire and the statue of Marcus Aurelius. Now we continue seeing some of the influence of the Greco-Roman work in the illuminated works. Um, I want to take a moment here and just talk about one of the little sidebars. Make sure you are reading those. But there is here a sidebar about the four evangelists. Please make sure you do know who these individuals are because they are going to play a prominent role in the art that we will be looking at in the next couple of weeks. Evangelist derives from the Greek word for, quote, one who announces good news, unquote, and namely this is considered the gospel of Christ. The first four books of the New Testament are the gospels, and they were written by the saints Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now Matthew and John were also apostles. The gospel books provide the authoritative account of the life of Jesus. Now, each evangelist has their own unique symbol um, or attribute, as we called them earlier. However, I'll be honest, I'm not 100% thrilled with the explanation that is given in this little sidebar. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in the upcoming chapters. However, just make sure you know Matthew is often shown with a winged man or an angel. Mark's symbol is a lion. Luke's symbol is an ox. Um, interesting with Luke, it is also claimed, which I believe we'll look at this work in this section. If not, it'll be in 106. Um, that it's claimed that he painted a portrait of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. And because of this, he is often the patron saint of artists. And then John's symbol is the eagle. Um, so I do want to make sure that you do know the evangelist, do make read uh, that section, and you can go back to that earlier section looking at Christianity and art to get more information. 
Okay, well, talking about painting, the painters of the court school and monastic scriptoria employed a wide variety of style arrived from late antique port. And you can read about this in more detail in the text, but we're going to go ahead and move on to architecture. Now, Charlemagne also encouraged the use of Roman building techniques in architecture. However, we're going to see new innovations are being used. For his models, he looked to Rome and Ravinia. Charlemagne's capital was in Aachen, and Aachen's chapel plan resembles San Vitale's that we looked at in chapter 9. Now, the chapel at Aachen was the first vaulted structure of the Middle Ages north of the Alps, and its construction dates are 792 to 805. Now, the Aachen plans were simpler than San Vitale's. Uh, for an example, there are no asp-like uh, extensions. Charlemagne's builders converted the lightness and complexity of San Vitale's interior into the simple massive geometry of the Aachen Chapel, and you can see that on the image on the left. Now the exterior, there are two cylindrical towers with spiral staircases that flank the entrance portal, and you can see this on the right. Um, and you can see early in the image on the right, you can see that tower even more clearly on the right hand side. Now this is important because it becomes the first step toward the great dual tower facades of Western European churches from the 10th century to the present. Now what's also interesting is Charlemagne had a second uh, story gallery where he could watch the proceedings and this followed the Imperial Gallery at Hagia Sophia also from chapter 9. Now, the widespread adoption of the early Christian basilica was crucial to the subse subsequent development of Western European church architecture. Some works closely followed the early Christian plan, but others had a more complex uh, form. And an important feature of most Carolingian basilicas were again the towers framing the west side of the church. And this began to be called as westwork, sometimes referred to as a castellum, which is Latin for castle or fortress, or turris, which is tower. And what this does, you can see the example here, is it creates a unified facade that greeted all those who entered. And the example shown is the west work of the Abbey Church at Corre, Germany, 873 to 885. So we see in this, we see a strong influence of the Greco-Roman that we did not see earlier in the chapter. Now, continuing on, we're going to look at the Otani Empire. Now, Charlemagne was laid to rest in 814 in the Palatine Chapel at Achaean. Louis the Pious ruled until 840. And then when he died, his three sons divided the empire into three sections and divided it amongst themselves. This led to a time of bloody conflict, including Viking invasions, piracy, and just internal strife, and this all helped lead to the collapse of the Carolingians. In the mid-10th century, the eastern part of the empire consolidated under the rule of a new Saxon line of German emperors called the Otenians, and it's because of this, because of the four emperors, three of them were named Otto. In 962 in Rome, the Pope crowned the first Otto as Emperor of Rome. The Otenian empires preserved and enriched the culture and traditions of the Carolingian period. And then the Ottoman line we're going to see ended in the early 11th century with the death of Henry II. And his reign was 102, 1002 to 1004. Now the architecture in the Ottonian Empire, the architects followed the Carolingian building basilica churches with towering spires and imposing westworks. The best preserved is the image on the left, which is the 10th century Ottonian Basilican, Basilica, which is in St. Catharchus in Germany. This was built 961 to 973. Now note the large asp that in the, that's in the image here, that was actually added later. That was added in the 19th century. Now what's interesting is the nave is one of the first in Western Europe to incorporate a gallery between the ground floor and the art, ground floor arcade and the Clara story. Now this is a design that actually became very popular in the seceding Romanesque era. But what's interesting with it here 
is we're not sure what it was used for. There's the idea that, oh, this is where the women were. Well, this was a church dedicated to a convent, and so the women would have been in these central areas. So we're not sure what it was used for. Now, some of the most important architectural patrons were actually church officials and not just rulers. An example of this is Bishop Bernard, uh, his reign from 993 to 1022. Um, he was the bishop of Heidensholm, Germany. He was the builder of the Abbey Church of St. Michael. And he wanted again, he made it a center for learning. In 1001, he traveled to Rome and studied the monument of the ancient empire. Now, St. Michael's was constructed between 1001 and 1003. And you can see here on the plan, it actually has a double transept plan, six towers, and westwork. Almost completely loses the tradition of basilica orientation towards the east. Now, another work that is here is with his trip to Rome, the early Christian carved wood doors at Santa Sabina may have inspired the bronze doors to St. Michael's. These are dated 1015 by an inscri inscription, and they are massive works for the time. They are more than 15 feet tall, and the metal workers cast each door as a single piece with the figural sculpture. So it's not each frieze, it's not its own individual. Each door is. So this was a massive work. Now these were placed in the portal to St. Michael's that led from the cloister where the monks would see them each time they entered the church. On the left door, we have scenes that are highlights from Genesis, such as the creation of Adam and Eve to concluding with Cain slaying Abel. At, on the right door, this recounts the life of Christ from the Annunci Annunciation to where Christ appears to Mary Magdalene. Now, as in early Christian times, the Ottonian clergy re interpreted the Hebrew Bible as prefiguring the New Testament. So the placement of these panels was done very intentionally. Now, the composition of the scenes of the doors derived from Carolingian, Carolingian manuscript illumination. They're starkly flat, but full of gestures and emotions. And you can see that in the work here on the right. Here we see God accusing Adam and Eve. And God, you can say, he's leaning towards them, and he's jabbing his finger out at them in accusation. Now, both Adam and Eve are crouched over and trying to use their arms to cover their nakedness, showing shame. And at the same time, they're trying to pass the blame. If you look, Adam is pointing back to Eve and Eve's pointing down to the serpent on the ground. But we see in this, right, it's relatively simple in form, but it's full of movement and this dynamic emotion. And we're going to see emotion continue into some other works. Now, in the Etonian period, interest in freestanding statuary also was revived. And we see this in the Ghetto Crucifix uh, in the Cologne Cathedral in Cologne, Germany, circa 970. And this is painted wood. And then the figure, not the cross, the figure is six feet two inches, showing you it's a large work. Now, this shows a concept of Christ dramatically different than seen in the Carolingian works. This one is much more Byzantine in nature. Here we see a suffering Jesus with strong emotional appeal. There is blood running down his face. His eyes are closed and his face is contorted in pain. His body sags under its weight and its muscle almost seems stretched to the limit. And this is all very emotional. You can see and understand his suffering. And it is considered the most powerful characterization of the intense agony of the early Middle Ages. Now, Otto III continued on with this line, and he was obsessed with reviving the Christian Roman Empire. In fact, he actually moved his court to Rome. And here on the left, we see a folio from the Gospel of Otto III. We see him as the large central figure and he's enthroned holding the scepter and the cross inscribed orb that signify his universal afford authority, also conforming to a Christian imperial iconographic tradition that began with Constantine. 
Now, unfortunately, his desire of con continuing to revive the Christian Roman Empire did not come to fruition. He actually died at the age of 21. And per his request, he was buried beside Charlemagne at Aachen. Now, on the right, you see one of the finest Ottonian books produced for the clergy. And this is what's known as the Uta Codex. Now, the patron was Uta, who was the abbess of the Niedermünster uh, Abbey from, or convent from 1002 to 1025. She was instrumental to bringing the Benedictine reforms to the convent. And what we see here is the dedication page. Now, this was dedicated to the Virgin Mary, who was the Virgin of Virgins, and the model for the nuns. Now, what's interesting, we can see this follows some of the traditions we've looked at in this lecture, but what's really interesting is if you look on the bottom left, the artist actually painted Uda last, and she's superimposed. She's not part of the intricate design, and so she's superimposed so that her head touches the Virgin's medallion, but just she does not penetrate it. She does not become part of it, clearly showing the separation of the divine and human realms. And what's also interesting, if you look, she is holding a book and offering it to the Virgin Mary, and what she's offering to her is the very book you are looking at. As we've said earlier, Henry II was the last Otinian emperor, after his death in 1024, Rome's influence waned. And what we're going to see is Romanesque Europe found unity, not politically, but with religious fever that manifested in launching the Crusades to free the Holy Land from the Muslim control. And we will continue looking at Romanesque Europe in the next lecture.